Put your hands together for Alicia Sorrell. Thank you all, and it's so lovely to be here. Last year, well, earlier last year, whenever Tony first asked me to speak, I thought, what in the world can I talk about when I come here? Because I come here to learn, and I feel so intimidated in this room <coughs> full of knowledge. But after I thought about it, I began thinking about the fact that, for me, last year, the conference developed a sort of informal theme. Because every time I talked to someone, when I walked past other conversations, I was hearing people say things like, I've started teaching. I'm thinking about writing a book. I'm thinking about becoming a teacher. And so I wanted to think about what, be, what makes a good teacher. Just because you know a lot of things doesn't mean you're able to teach it. And I've discovered this for myself. So let's think about something. Is there anyone here that's been making shoes for 10 years? OK. A 10 year meaning, hey. <laughs> we'll just leave that optional. OK, how about 20? OK, how about 30? So I want you to look at your hands and think about all the knowledge that's in there. For me, I can think about skiving. And when I think about skiving, I just imagine I'm, I'm one with that knife. I know how it feels. I can think about kangaroo. I can think about alligator, ostrich. And my fingertips almost tingle with the knowledge that's in them about how that feels different and how I should adjust the knife. So that's the knowledge. We have the skills. And now the problem is getting it back out. We've got it in our hands, and now we have to get it back out. So one of the qualities of a good teacher is being knowledgeable. It sounds obvious, but you have to know your subject. You can't teach what you don't know. For me, I never thought I would teach. I didn't think I wanted to teach. I didn't think I'd be a good teacher. I had an old boot maker tell me once that I wouldn't know what I was doing until I'd made at least 500 pairs of boots. And that took me about 10 years, and he was right. I didn't. But at about 10 years, I saw this interesting shift take place. I saw the, the knowledge move from my head to my hands. And that, that was fascinating to see that suddenly it was there. Um, when I first started, I'd be building a pair of boots, and I'd stop and say, well, what comes next? Or worse, <coughs> I just missed a step. Because to me, boot making was a set of steps. Do this then do this, then do that. And over time, it became a flow. And then forgetting a step or missing a step wasn't a problem anymore because it was a, it was a hole to me. Can anybody here remember learning how to inseam? You still remember. That's great. Sometimes when it's so long ago, it's like blinking. You don't remember learning how to do it. You've just always done it. So when you're learning, each step is a separate and completely complex process. Will the, will the bristle go through? Will the other bristle go through? Will the bristle stay on? Did, will I break my awl? How, where is my awl going to come out? And then with, with knowledge, when those skills move into your hands, you can put the tip of the awl in, and you know exactly where it's going to exit the insult. You feel it all the way through. So when you're a when you're experienced, when you're a veteran, then you're fully present for each stitch. Each one, you're there. But at the same time, you're singing along with the radio or thinking about what you're going to have for lunch because part of your mind is free to roam around. To me, it's like meditation. I love inseaming because I can just get lost in it. It's mindless for me. So that happens with, with experience. And this foundation is, of knowledge is necessary before you can be a good teacher. But then there's the hard part. <coughs> you got to pull it all back out and put it into words. You have to be articulate and you have to provide clear explanation. So we, have, we talked about how experience allows the knowledge to move from your head to your hands. 
And now, if you're going to teach, you have to pull it back out and put it into words. It's not enough to just say, do it like that. You have to break it down into words. When I first started, I have a YouTube video. And when I first started doing my YouTube video, well, for one thing, I've always thought I had really ugly hands. Short, fat fingers, short, fat hands. You know, I was embarrassed about them. The first time I did a YouTube video, the perspective was down on my hands as I was doing some sort of inlay. And when I watched the video, all of a sudden I went, oh my goodness, my hands are beautiful. <laughs> it really changed my perspective because they're still short and fat. But I saw the move, the knowledge and grace. It was like a ballet. And that changed my perspective of my hands. And there was once when Dale was filming me for, what, for my YouTube video, and I said something like, okay, start stitching. And I began sewing on the machine. And he said, stop. You just did about five or six things there. And I didn't realize it. So here's the thing. When I start <coughs> stitching, I bring the needle down into the leather. And at that point, the, the thread lifter comes down also. Well, that leaves a loop of thread. And that loop of thread, sometimes when you start stitching, it balls up. That loop of thread is why. It's got slack in there, and that's what gets balled up and creates a knot. So I bring the needle down all the way, and then the, the needle threads from left to right. So from the right side, I pull the thread, and I pull out that, that slack. And then I raise the, the lift, and I bring the thread around to the front of the needle, set the lift down on it. Now my hands are free. I can start sewing, and some people will hold the thread as they start to sew. I don't have to do that because the lift is on the thread, my hands are free, and I can start sewing. See how long that took me to say that? <laughs> That's entirely different from start sewing. <laughs> so you have to, all, all of those things that have just become a simple and easy, thoughtless process to you, you have to come back and break it down into words. Mm. And a student needs to hear those words. I remember one time my teacher asking me to do a task on a machine that I was not familiar with, and when I hesitated, he said, oh, you'll be fine, and walked away. Narrator voice, she was not fine. <laughs> I didn't have enough experience on the machine. If he wanted me to do a good job, he needed me to demonstrate, and he needed to stand by and watch me do it and explain things. I acknowledge that some students have to be pushed. They, they don't think they have, they know what they do know. But... Throwing them into a situation unprepared teaches them to hate a technique or to fear a machine. So give them the skills they need before you just push them off the deep end. There are many ways that putting this craft into words is difficult. For instance, when I have students, <coughs> cowboy boots, the, the vamp is just one big piece. So you have to wrap it around the last one. Sometimes you really have to put some effort into it to, to get it lasted. And one of my biggest challenges with students is, how hard do I say to pull? Because with some students, I can say, give it a good pull, and they like rip everything apart. And then with other students, I can say, pull with everything you've got, and they act like it's a wet Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> so pull hard means different things to different students. That's another way you really have to use your words. A good teacher is generous. Don't be selfish with information. Don't hoard information. Tell people what you know. Like Tony mentioned earlier about the, the makers who would turn their back so that people couldn't see. Don't, don't be that person. This craft is so different than it was 100 years ago. If Tony tells me everything he knows, it doesn't hurt him. We're, there are more buyers than there are makers. So don't be selfish with information. For me, I have an Instagram, I have a Facebook business page, I have a blog, and I have a regular YouTube show. My YouTube, by the way, is Custom Boots, and my show is It's a Boot Life, and then my Instagram is at Sorrel Custom Boots. Anyone wants to look me up. So on the YouTube show, I do tutorials, and on the blog and the Instagram, often instead of just posting pictures, I will say, this is what I was doing, this is why I was doing it, this is how I did it. And people will often say to me, why do you share? Why do you give out this information so freely? Aren't 
you helping your competition? Okay, for one thing, I don't ever allow someone to say the words your competition to me. I correct them immediately and say my peers. I don't view anyone as competition. And second, it took me 28 years. I guess it's 29 now. I like to tell people I started when I was four, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. Um, it took me 29 years to get to where I am today. I can tell you everything I know. And if it takes you 29 years, 29 years from now, you'll be as good as I am, and I'll either be 29 years better, or I'll be dead, or I won't care. But the point is, it didn't hurt me at all. Nothing that I told you <coughs> is going to, you can't compete with me, and that's okay. So I want to share everything, because ultimately it's not about me. It's about the craft moving forward. <coughs> And this sounds kind of like a contradiction. You also want to be very controlled with the information that you give out as a good teacher. You need to measure that information out carefully. You don't want to be selfish and hoard it, but on the other hand, you can't spray your students with information like a fire hose. You've got to give it to them when they're ready. I've observed with students that they're often unable to hear what they're not ready for. You can say the words to them, but they're honestly, it's not, they're not comprehending it. And so you do have to be careful about when and where you get this information. Make sure they're ready. For instance, in cowboy boot making, the counter is a piece of solvent. It's very, very hard and stiff. And when I'm teaching a class, we need the counter ready to put on the back panel. So what I'll do with my students is I'll, I'll get the counter ready in the first day or two of class. I do that. They don't do it. I'll give them a few words of information about what we're doing and why, but basically I just make the counter and they watch. Because at that point, it doesn't do me any good to say, okay, we need to sky the top because it's going to be sewn to the back panel and so it needs to be thin enough to sew through and we need to sky the bottom because it has to wrap around the last. They don't know what a counter is, they don't know what lasting is, they don't know what a back panel is. None of those words make sense to them. So I just do it. And then later, when we sew that counter on the back panel, and we start lasting, then suddenly it begins to make sense. Now they're ready for those words. On the other hand, I sometimes like to give out just a little bit more information than is completely necessary. When I do my YouTube videos, I like to leave out evidence of what I've been doing, how I got to where I am, or maybe what comes next, because some students will never see that, and others are looking at every detail, and, and they pick up things. And so I like to leave little clues around for the students who are looking for those clues. And sometimes you, they, they get them better because they had to reach for it. Okay, we want to be committed. We want to be true to, the, to tradition. It's so important to be a faithful keeper of knowledge. I tell my students, you can't break the rules until you know the rules. I don't know how to express this one without revealing some of my own opinions and prejudices. I'm personally a little dubious by beginning boot and shoemakers or artists or craftsmen that refer to their work as rustic or deconstructed. That's, that's my prejudice. Let's say if Jim McCormick made a shoe and it was a really rough finish and you could see jagged edges and it wasn't sanded well, we would think, what statement was he trying to make? What is he doing? Why is he doing this? And we would be forced to, to think about what he's trying to express to us. On the other hand, if someone makes their third pair of shoes and they're kind of rough and they're not sanded well and they're not finished well, I don't think it's fair to call that an artistic statement because they didn't really know any better. And I'm wearing my third pair of shoes so <laughs> that I made. So I'm actually an example of this. These shoes are not finished well. Sorry, guys. Because I'm trying to learn so much at once. But they're not rustic. They're not deconstructed. They're, I don't know what I'm doing yet. So as teachers, it's our responsibility to teach the traditional techniques and convey the history of our, class, of our craft. It might change with time, 
and change is okay. It's not fair for old people to hold a craft hostage and insist it never changes. But on the other hand, we don't want it to change and evolve for no other reason than we just didn't tell people what the traditions are. But again, on the other hand, we have to be flexible. We have to be willing to adjust. Conveying rules and traditions is vital, but we also need to remain mindful of what is important and what is habit. So for me in the boot shop, I always start with the right boot. I'm just in the habit of I always start with the right boot, and I teach my students, always start with the right one. I've talked to students, and they've gone to classes where the teacher always started with the left. That's just habit. It's okay, but you need to get in a habit there because when you get interrupted, and you will get interrupted, you, you know where you were because you always started with one or the other. You also need to acknowledge and accommodate each student. Uh, when I skive, I have a special skiving knife I use, and I put my thumb on top of it when I'm pull skiving. So I had a student who had a very flexible thumb, and after a couple of days, again, she didn't say in the first 20 seconds, oh, there's my thumb. It took her a couple of days, but she said, this is really hurting my thumb because it's bending back. And so we thought about it, and we came up with a different way for her to hold the knife so that she can continue skiving. She was still creating a good sky. She had to do it a little differently. That's okay. Another thing, when I first started out, I, I can't use an edge trimmer on the finisher, the little wheels. I'm terrified of them. I'm not good at them. It took me years, and one day I finally realized the reason I'm terrified of those is because the guy who trained me is 6'2". So he's showing me how to use the finishing wheels, and I'm trying to learn them at eye level. It's totally different and totally terrifying. So think about that with your students. You know, what are you doing that maybe isn't working for them because of size or, or weight or height or whatever? So they, they might be capable, capable of doing something, but maybe they're not capable of doing something your way. So think about what the end result needs to be instead of necessarily always exactly the way you do it. Don't give up on a student just because they need to perform a task a, task a little bit differently. As a teacher, we need to be efficient and we need to pass along time goals. Sometimes when you work alone, it's, it's easy to just be lazy because, hey, you've got all day and no one's there overseeing you. But you need to be efficient. You need to be neat. Your tools need to have a place. You need to teach your students that if they are spending time searching for tools, they're wasting time alone. Time is money. And, and you need to have time goals. You need to convey these time goals to your students. Give them a goal and give them an expectation to work for. Maybe you can't do this job this quickly now, but work for that. When I worked for Jay, my, my first boot making teacher, he told me cowboy boot tops have two front panels, two back panels, and they have decorative stitching, and we were doing a lot of one row stitch patterns. And he said, when you can do one row on all four panels in 30 minutes, I'll give you a raise. So boy, I worked hard for that. I got my first raise in about a month, but even now, 30, 29 years later, when I'm stitching boot tops, I keep an eye on the clock. I've got, you know, if it's a 10 row boot pattern, then every 30 minutes I'm checking to see if I've gotten another row on. Because it's just a good way to keep yourself accountable. So it's not an excuse for sloppy work. It's simply a matter of discipline and keeping yourself accountable. So, for instance, Tony, how long does it take you to inseam a pair of shoes? About 40 minutes. 40 minutes for a pair. Okay, so we all know that, that Tony's superhuman. <laughs> but if it takes Tony 40 minutes, set yourself a goal, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. Maybe you won't get there for a while, but have a goal. Know that it takes Tony 40 minutes. Work towards that. Keep yourself accountable. I think a good teacher is, is humble. I think a good teacher can admit mistakes. Because no matter how much experience, we all make mistakes, or we have made them. And let your students learn from those mistakes. You've 
make them, maybe you can keep them from having to make them. I don't feel like I do my craft any favors by attempting to pre present myself as being perfect because this creates unrealistic expectations for students. Then they begin to think, well, I'm not perfect yet. What's wrong with me? And, and that's, that's needless to be discouraged over that. I'd rather demonstrate that this craft is endlessly challenging and stimulating and it's never boring. Plus, for me as a teacher, I am also really clever at working mistakes into my class so that students feel that I'm approachable. For instance, <laughs> one time I was teaching a boot making class and we started preparing the soles and we put the glue on, we put them in the water, we took them out of the water, we put them in the bag and left them all overnight. We came in the next day and I had cut out two bright soles. <laughs> mistakes happen. One time I was in a class, I was doing an inlay overlay class, and I'd just given my students a really sternly worded lecture about knife safety. And I was talking and not paying attention, and I put my fingers on the straight edge and mm. took the knife and it was cut off the side of my finger. So you're going to make mistakes, and if you don't present yourself as perfect, it'll be a lot easier to overcome those when you do make them right in front of your students. A good teacher is passionate. We need to express joy. Why are you a shoemaker? Unless your experience is really different from mine, it's not because it's made you rich and famous. So there's a reason that you're making shoes. It's a physically challenging craft. It's difficult, it's expensive to get started, it might never make you wealthy, but we choose to become shoemakers because it's satisfying. Don't lose your passion and allow your students to see it. For myself, I'm always just a little bit suspicious of a shoemaker who has the attitude they know it all. I love boot making because I constantly run into things that I don't know or I need to do better. I find great comfort in this. Making cowboy boots intrigues me, it challenges me, it frustrates me, and some days it makes me really, really mad but it never bores me. So allow your students to see why you choose this craft. Let them see your passion for collecting old tools and tell them the stories of the old boot makers that you've known. Let them see that passion. Be curious. Continue to learn. That's why I come here, is because I have so much to learn. And, and I don't want to stop that. Stay curious and continue to learn. A few of you might have seen a YouTube video I did several months ago where I'm hand stitching a pair of shoes. Okay, I want to make it very clear I was not teaching in that video. I was simply sharing my experience of hand stitching a pair of soles for the first time. And it, it went badly, which I shared. <laughs> But it was important to me that, that students sometimes see that process of starting something that you're bad at and deliberately choosing to do something that you're bad at because it's challenging and fun. And because I'm fully committed, as I mentioned before, I'm wearing the third pair of shoes that I've ever made. They're terrible, and I'm nervous to wear them in front of you all. Finish is awful, and I stitched them on a machine because I wanted to see if you could stitch on a machine and still get a nice small waist, and I didn't. And they have rhinestones on them, and I, <laughs> I figure everyone's going to look at my shoes with rhinestones and think, ah, she just likes sparkly things because she's from the U.S. <laughs> but I like to give myself little challenges, and so I was at the guy that was teaching the class had this whole box full of rhinestones, and he said, I bought these rhinestones because I thought women would want to put rhinestones on their shoes when they came for classes. And no one's ever wanted the rhinestone. So I went, to, I went to bed that night and I was thinking, okay, if I had to make a pair of shoes with rhinestones, how would I do it to where they would be the least obnoxious possible? <laughs> and this is what I came up with. And then I dropped them down in the groving holes so that they were, they were almost flush and I don't feel like they're gonna fall off. And it was just a little challenge I gave myself to try to Learn something new. So cowboy boots are my livelihood, and I'm serious about them. But for right now, I'm allowing myself to have fun learning about shoemaking. It's, it's a hobby to me. 
and, and I've never really had a hobby before. I had someone ask me one time what my hobbies were, and I said eating and sleeping, and they thought I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have a hobby. So last night, I don't, have a, I don't have a thing for this because I added it. Last night, I was talking to Bill Bird, and I realized there's something else that a teacher needs, and that's a teacher needs to be positive. They need to be complimentary. It's, it's not helpful to say, that's crap, you did it wrong. That doesn't help them, it doesn't teach them, it doesn't encourage them. When I was in, uh, several years ago, my husband and I joined an organization called Toastmasters. And Toastmasters is a speaking and leadership club. And each part of the meeting has three parts. There's formal speeches, and there's evaluations, and there's table topics, which is brief on the just on the spot, short speeches. The evaluations was actually the hardest thing because you're randomly chosen to evaluate someone else's speech and you have to listen, that's hard. You have to listen to what they said and then you have to evaluate them. And we learned a sandwich method. You say, you did this really well, you could work on this, and by the way, this was great. And that is an unthreatening way to move people forward. So the, the other way sandwich doesn't work so well. This is crap, this isn't bad, and this is terrible. That method doesn't work real well. But when you sandwich things in there to where people feel, I, I know older people like to talk about how sensitive young millennials are, but basically we're, we're all sensitive. No one likes to be attacked. And it's so nice when you feel that you're, you're being seen and appreciated, but do this better. It moves you forward. So I would say, as a teacher, work on that sandwich method of looking to see what your student is doing and telling them what they're doing well and moving them forward into doing something better. In conclusion, I do want to end with a quote. James Harriet was a country vet veterinarian who lived and worked in this area. And I was around 10 years old when I discovered his books. And they've been my favorites ever since. He wrote about his life, and he tells of cold, wet, miserable days, unhappy clients, and lots and lots of experience with the wrong end of house. But through his books, there's this unmistakable thread of joy and wonder and humor. And he says, I love writing about my job because I loved it. And it was a particularly interesting one when I was a young man. It was like holidays with pay to me. And I love that quote, holidays with pay. And that's what we need to model for students is that joy, how lucky we are to get to do what we love and get to meet other people who love it just as much and talk to them and, and see what they know that I don't know and tell them things that, that I know and share and make friends. Karina and I, a few years ago, we were attending a show in, in Wiesbaden and we posted online that we had plans to go to a shoe museum in Switzerland. And some lady wrote on Facebook, I live near that museum. I will come pick you up at Wiesbaden and I will take you to my home and you can stay at my home and I will feed you and I will take you to that museum. And that sounded great until suddenly this strange woman was walking across the arena and we got into her car and I'm realizing I'm getting into the car with a woman I've never met. <laughs> but we had so much fun and now she's a very dear friend and as it turned out she and her husband were chefs and we were fed so well and their home was lovely and we got to go see this museum. and. That's what life as a shoemaker has been like for me, is meeting all these fascinating new people and meeting really nice people. It kind of restores your faith in the world, which, which is challenged sometimes. Thank you.